Just a few brief announcements this morning before we get into our message. Um, as everyone knows, um, we are working through uh, the book of Luke. We're on chapter 12. So as we continue through this reading challenge, this week it's chapter 12. And, you know, for anybody who is visiting or here for the first time, hey guys, we're doing a reading challenge. <laughs> uh, we are reading through the book of Luke together, and we are on chapter 12. <laughs> Um, also, um, we have this amazing prayer journey that we are all on right now. It's called All In. Um, the wonderful Tony Davis is spearheading it, and um, on a weekly basis, she's sending out um, just prayers that are coming in and things that are happening and the experiences that are being shared. So if you aren't currently on that um, email and you would like to be, uh, there are cards that look like this at our information center or at like coffee and um, all you have to do is add your email and you will start receiving all of the wonderful things that are happening with that team. Uh, last week after service we had options for everybody to stay after and learn about the new teams that are being formed so a big thank you to everyone who stayed and uh, learned more about what we're going to be doing as we transition from this space over to Community Park. Uh, this coming week, there will be some things happening over at 8th Street, and so if anyone wants to jump on that team, uh, you can follow up with Pastor Zach after service. Again, if you're new and you don't know who Pastor Zach is, he's going to be the one standing on stage for about 30 minutes talking, get familiar with his face, and then find him after, and he's the one that you can talk to. Um, let's see. Last thing, connection card. Everyone within arm's reach has a card that looks like this. Information that I'm sharing today is also information, again, that's shared on a weekly basis that comes from our office. And so if you aren't currently getting those emails and you would like to be, please fill out the connection card and just um, provide us that information. Oh my gosh, you have a little baby. <laughs> anyway, okay, with that, uh, welcome Pastor Zach as we Continue in stories. That's the second time that baby has made his. Is it the same baby? Oh, I'm like, we have more, <laughs> more than that baby. Morning, church. Uh, it's good to be with you this morning. I, um, it's been a little bit of a chaotic morning, and um, yeah, it's been kind of crazy. So, um, like, I feel like I'm untucked. I don't feel like I'm like myself, but. My name is Zach. I'm the lead pastor here at the, the River Church. It's a little snowy outside, and we're just, we're just chilling out inside. We're, we're going through our, our Gospel of Luke series called Stories. Um, and before I jump into anything, I'd just like to share with you, so this last week we were in Luke chapter 10 and Luke chapter 11, and we're going to be talking about Luke chapter 10, verse 25 through 37 here in a little bit. I just want to read it for you, um, so you get a kind of a bearing as to where we're going to be this morning. So this is chapter 10 in Luke's Gospel. On one occasion, in the expert, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered Jesus, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, Who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down to Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went, went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed on the other side, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Jesus turned to the man, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let's pray. 
Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for your word this morning, Lord. And I just pray that you work through my words and through the, the meditation of each of our hearts so that we might be able to be lifting you up in all things, God. Um, bless this time together. Fill this room with your spirit. We ask all this your son's name. Amen. So now we're in Luke chapter 10 and chapter 11. Um, this is what we've heard so far over and over and over again in Luke's gospel. Jesus... His life, his ministry leads us to understand what it looks like to look at the world differently. How we see things differently. Back in chapter 3, if you recall, John the Baptist shows up and he preaches the the message of repentance or the word that we use was metanoia, which simply means to think differently, right? And time after time after time, so far in Luke's gospel, Jesus has been challenging the way that the world thinks and been pointing toward a different way, a kingdom mindset. So if you think more like Jesus, all through the, the first 10 chapters, through the first 11 chapters, if you think more like Jesus, Jesus says, if you think more like me, you're probably gonna act more like me. If I've come to proclaim the good news of redemption and restoration to the poor, if we are going to follow behind his message, if we're going to hang the banner of Jesus above our heads, if we're going to think like him, we need to act like him. So if he's going to proclaim good news to the poor, we should proclaim good news to the poor. If he's intentional about going to God in prayer, we should do our best to imitate his prayer life. If he gathers around with friends and strangers around a table and blesses bread and breaks it with them, we too should be focusing on creating community, forming community and relationships in a similar way. If Jesus is the example of practicing the ways of the kingdom of God, And practicing Jesus' ways would probably be a good idea for us as those who follow Jesus. Which leads us to our reading today. Many of us know this story. The Good Samaritan. The word Samaritan, if you just think about it, it's, it's in hospitals, it's on schools, law offices. It all points us to understand that like the word Samaritan means good person, right? Which is why we use it with our kids a lot. We teach our kids this story all the time. If you'd ever went to summer camp at any point in time, like church camp, this story was like one of, in, one of the stories in the rotation. Because it is central to who we want to be as people. Not just of, as people of God, but as people in general. Right? It parallels the golden rule. Do unto others as you would like done to yourself. And we, I mean, we just drill this into our kids' head because we want them to grow up with good morals and good ethical understanding of the world. So we're like, you want to be like the Good Samaritan, right? But the story here that Jesus tells is not just leaning toward telling us how we need to be a good person. It's not just trying to teach us about what it means to treat others kindly. In this very well-known parable, Jesus isn't laying out a set of rules to follow so that we just get eternal life as the, the lawyer was looking for. Jesus, in this parable, lays out a radical countercultural practice, which we will call kingdom hospitality. For about a year now, our church's leadership has spent meeting after meeting talking about hospitality. What does this word mean? How can we be more like a church that Jesus would want to be a part of? How can we love others well, even though that means we have to get uncomfortable to do so? How can we lean into this concept of kingdom hospitality? How do we do it on Sundays? As somebody walks through the door, how, how do we practice kingdom hospitality as, as, as someone who is as right off the street? And how do we love them the way that Jesus would love them? Right? And this is what we've been asking ourselves. Not, and not just on Sunday. It's like, how do we live this every single day in our lives? We've asked ourselves this question over and over again. Sometimes we do okay. Sometimes we miss the mark. Because like, we, we don't want to feel too uncomfortable when we, we're extending hospitality to people. Like, we'll, we're, we're willing to make a cup of coffee for them. We're willing to, to shake their hand. But like if you, if you talk about like what's happening across the street, we really don't want to get there quite yet. Let's, let's master in here first, right? So we've been battling with this inside. Like what does kingdom hospitality look like, not just in this space, but across the street? The word hospitality, it shows up a few times in the New Testament, specifically when the Apostle Paul talks about it. As he's writing to different churches in the, the first century, 
throughout the, the region. And I think seeing the Greek word that he uses has helped me understand, or the, the Greek phrase that he uses, extend hospitality, has helped me understand a little bit better in general what kingdom hospitality looks like, especially as it relates to the Good Samaritan. As I hope to explore this morning, I think that, that the, the parable of the Good Samaritan is more than just being about being a better person. There's something so much deeper, so much greater that I think Paul speaks to in his, in his, his, his phrase to extend hospitality. So we're going to start in Romans chapter 12 this morning. He's talking to the Romans. He's telling them, if you want to have an impact on the world around you, you have to first start with a posture of love. This is Romans 12, starting in verse 9. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. This phrase, extend hospitality, it, it, there are two words that, that need to be translated here. The first, to extend or to give, is the Greek word dio, dioko, to seek after eagerly, to pursue, earnestly endeavor. And the second word there is philozenia, or hospitality, love to the stranger. So if you just think about what Paul is saying to the Romans here, he's saying, you need to extend hospitality. You need to eagerly seek to love the stranger. You need to, to pursue loving others well. No matter if they're strange, no matter if they're unknown, no matter if they're different, eagerly seeking to love the other. This is the concept that Paul talks about, and really this is the concept that Jesus is speaking to as he's talking about the Good Samaritan. The kingdom hospitality that Jesus is speaking to, kingdom hospitality, is making space in your life to love and welcome the stranger, to eagerly pursue them with reckless abandon of grace. So now if we think about it, Jesus has set the mindset, right? And he set the practices, and he said, if you want to follow me, you should probably practice kingdom hospitality. If we are going to raise the banner of Jesus over our heads, it would make sense to practice loving and making space for the stranger in our own lives. But if we are honest with ourselves, in this time, really in this place, our world, it doesn't embrace a posture of love for strangers. If anything, it embraces a fear of strangers. The word for this is pretty much the exact opposite. Xenophobia. The fear of the stranger. And while we might want to think that we build our morals on a story like the Good Samaritan, where it's good and right to, have, to give everything you got in order to, 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 to serve another person, to live out the golden rule, there's a lot in this world that tells me, that leads me to believe that we are only a Good Samaritan when we, it doesn't make us too uncomfortable. It's good to give the shirt off our back as long as they look like us or are a member of our, our tight-knit community or are a part of our tribe. But if someone is not like you and is in need, if for whatever reason, in whatever is part of your life, you have come to realize that like maybe that person is against me, that person is an enemy of, of my life, if they are in a different place or they look differently, man, we should be weary of extending a helping hand. Many of us would love to think that we live in this world where if we just be kingdom oriented, if we just embrace kingdom hospitality, if we're just led by love and philozenia, everything would be great. But we don't live in this vacuum that just pushes love out. If anything, we seem to live in a world that's led with a posture of fear and not love of xenophobia and not philozenia, which isn't crazy. I'm not like saying stuff that you're not realizing in your own life. I'm not like preaching this crazy message where like, oh no, like the world out there is filled with love. No, you know that the world is filled with fear. 
The posture of the world, the ways of the world, aren't oriented toward creating a a loving atmosphere. The ways of the world are so self-centric, and and anything that challenges that self-centricness, that that lifestyle that I want to live, man, I'm going to push up against that. Well, in Jesus' time, I'm probably sure that xenophobia existed, but it seems like now more than ever, the parable of the Good Samaritan puts us at a really difficult fork in the road. A fork that you may have dealt with many times before this morning, or maybe not. A fork that challenges the way you treat people. And essentially, it challenges the posture that you, you have when you come in contact with anyone. This morning, as we wrestle with this as a church and as individuals, I want to ask the question, what would happen to us and to the people we're trying to love in the name of Jesus if we eagerly pursued a posture of love? if we eagerly pursued a posture of kingdom hospitality for all people, those who are like us and those who are not like us, our friends and our family and strangers alike, what would it look like to live a life of kingdom hospitality? What would it look like to imitate Jesus in this way? So we're going to go back to the story in Luke chapter 10 to kind of to wrestle with this. Starting in verse 25 again, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? Who, how do you read it? So Jesus is asking him questions. He's not answering the question. This is Jesus' style usually, as you've been able to see in Luke chapter 10. He doesn't necessarily answer questions. He usually comes back and asks another question that, to his question, right? So the lawyer answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. So the lawyer, being well versed in the law of Moses, answered Jesus, his question with a combination of verses from the the book of Deuteronomy and the book of Leviticus. So both of these are the law of Moses, right? And based on the law, based on simply the scripture alone, the lawyer is 100% right, A+. What the lawyer is trying to do here is he's trying to understand what are the rules, what is the set of guidelines that I have to do to get what I want, right? Right? Based on the law alone, what the law tells me, I'm right. And Jesus says I'm right. Do this and you'll live. Do this and you will have what you desire. Because all he's wanting, he he says, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life, Lord? That's what he wants. So Jesus says, yeah, if you do that, you will live. And you will have exactly what you desire. You will get what you deserve. Now Jesus doesn't tell him how to do this. He just tells him that if you do it, then you get what you want. You have to understand this lawyer, he's, he's looking for a how. He's looking for the, the right combination of words or, or set of rules to, to be able to, to unlock the door to eternal life. He wants guidelines. He wants a system to follow. He's just trying to say the right words so that that Jesus goes, yep, you're in. So then he follows up. He wants to make sure that he's he's getting to where he's, that he wants to hear Jesus say, you're in. That's what he wants. So he continues, but he desiring to justify himself said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? He wanted to justify himself. He wanted to make sure that he was right. But he Something happened there where he got tripped up in the, the question, right? He didn't, he didn't quite understand what, who the neighbor was. And he wanted to make sure that it, he was right. He wanted to make sure that his understanding of who the neighbor is was correct. So he wanted to justify himself. You can still see that he's challenging Jesus here. Like, who is my neighbor? Go ahead, you tell me, because I think I know. And while he probably recited these words a hundred times, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, all your spirit, And love the neighbor as yourself. He's probably said that hundreds of times. He probably has it on his wrist. He's got like some scroll in his wrist, on his wrist, that is able to pull that out, and he knows it right there, right? He knows these words. But he wants to know from Jesus, Jesus, tell me, tell me what I gotta do. 
Tell me who I got to love to get what I want. Lord, tell me who my neighbor is so, so I can tell you that I've done exactly what you've asked of me, so then you tell me that I get what I want. Tell me who it is I have to love, and I'll do it. Lord, just tell me who my neighbor is. Tell me the right people, and I will go, and I will love them the best I can so that I get what I want. Jesus replied to him, the man is going down to Jerusalem, to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. So Jesus doesn't, again, answer the question. He gives him a story. And he's telling the story to this, this man and probably a, a number of Jewish people, right? So you should assume that the man who is now in the story, who's been beaten, is Jewish. He's probably a religious man, because why would Jesus be telling this story if he wasn't, right? Continues, now by chance a priest was going down that road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Now I need you to understand that the priest isn't completely wrong in what he was doing here. The priest, probably from the other side of the road, couldn't really tell if the man was dead. He didn't know if he was alive. He didn't know if he needed help. But if he was dead, and if the priest went over there, and if the priest touched him, all of a sudden, we got a big situation on our hands. Because if he touches him, now he becomes ceremoniously unclean. And if he touches him, he can't do what he is supposed to do. So he didn't want to go over there and touch him and check to see if he was okay because that would screw him up. You kind of see the priority list, right? Becoming, being ceremoniously pure was more important than helping the person, the guy on the side of the road. So in defense of the priest, he wasn't exactly wrong. Continues, so likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Same reason that the priest passed by. He didn't want to screw himself up. He didn't want to be unpure. He didn't want to like, have to go to temple for, for 40,000 days or whatever it would be and, and have to, to repent of, of whatever he had to do. He didn't want to have to do that. I'm just going to avoid this situation altogether. He didn't want to get his hands and his soul dirty by touching some dead guy. That wasn't on his list of things to do that day. So now the audience is sitting there saying, okay, the priest passed by, a Levi passed by. I see what you're doing here, Jesus. Like, you're going to say that a not-so-religious Jewish man is going to come by, and he's going to save the day. And that's us, right? Like, we are the neighbors, right? Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Because it's a Jewish rabbi telling a story about a Jewish man on the side of the road. This all makes sense. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Now you have to understand, Samaritans are people from a region that the Jewish people do not go into. They had no dealings with one another, because the Jews and the Samaritans did not get along. In fact, the Jews would often refer to the Samaritans as dogs. Their, their relationship was really messy between the two cultures. So as Jesus is telling this parable, and as soon as he said, a Samaritan man was the one who stopped on the side of the road to help this Jewish man, it would have just, they would have like stopped. They couldn't have probably even heard the rest of the story at that point in time. Because a Samaritan would have been the last person who would have helped a beaten Jewish man on the side of the road. The Samaritan probably would have been the first person to kick him while he was down to take anything else that was there with him. But there he was, an outsider, a person who didn't belong in the story, showing compassion, cleaning wounds, placing this man on a donkey, walking next to him to the next village, and paying for two months, a two-month stay for this man to rehabilitate himself. He saw a man, the Samaritan, this outsider, this, this, this demonized person, saw a man in need and stepped up. He did all he could to help him. 
The Samaritan, this outsider, the spiritually deprived man, was the hero of the story. For us, we know this really well. This story isn't that big a deal, but for the lawyer and the rest of those listening at that time, this would have just blown their minds. In this story, Jesus presents a couple things. Radical inclusion of the outsider, but not the outsider receiving mercy, but the outsider having the ability to love someone. The outsider being able to show grace to someone. An outsider having a role in the kingdom work. This kingdom hospitality Jesus is talking about extends far beyond any boundaries or borders that any of us can put up. He continues by asking the lawyer a question. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And he said, the lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Now this story, we know the story so well, but do you see what Jesus actually has done here? He flips the question. He flips the lawyer's question to be something completely different. The lawyer began by asking, if I'm to love God and love my neighbor, who is that? Who is my neighbor? Because to get what I want, to get eternal life, I need to find them and love them so I receive eternal life. But Jesus, in this parable, he reframes the perspective. He reframes the question. Instead of wondering, who is my neighbor? Jesus says, you should ask yourself the question, how can I be a better neighbor to anyone I come in contact with? The outsider, the stranger, the demonized, the Samaritan, the one who is outside of the faith, understood the law of Moses far better than the priest and the Levite and this lawyer. Church, that feeling inside of you right now is conviction. (laughs) Because this is a message for us. If kingdom hospitality means making space in our lives to love and welcome strangers, we should hear this parable as a calling to understand better and call, be called to a life of hospitality that's far more than a cup of coffee, that's far more than a shake of the hand, that's far more than just a saying hello to people. This parable is, is not about building up a ministry. Kingdom hospitality is not a ministry. Kingdom hospitality is the way of Jesus Kingdom hospitality opens our eyes to the downtrodden and it opens our our hearts and our eyes and our our souls to, to bringing the outsider in to serve them no matter how different they are from us so that they might be able to be completely healed and whole again. Kingdom hospitality calls us to place aside our status it calls us to act and, and see and serve, to tend to the ones in need, even if you have to become uncomfortable in doing so. Even if it costs you something to do so. Kingdom hospitality calls us to toss aside our, our, our desire for comfort. It, it, it sheds our, our fear of the other, or fear of what happens to us if we reach out to those in need. Jesus, time after time after time, sits and eats with sinners. He touches lepers. He calls tax collectors. He comes alongside women with debilitating diseases and heals them and touches them and, so that they might be one again in the family of God. Time after time after time, Jesus invites people to understand what does kingdom hospitality look like it's not just here in this story, but it happens over and over again in his ministry. Because Jesus' mission wasn't just to, to gain followers. It wasn't to build big buildings. It wasn't to make sure that he was the most well-known. No, in fact, his mission was more about people than any of us really understand. The radical nature of this parable of the Good Samaritan points us toward understanding that Jesus' sole mission was people. Anyone and everyone is a neighbor. 
No matter where they come from, no matter what they look like, no matter how old they are, no matter what their past look like, no matter what their faith background is, no matter if they've been an enemy or not, everyone is your neighbor. Not just the people you surround yourself with. Everyone. Mr. Lawyer, don't ask me the question, who is my neighbor? Because the simple answer is everyone. You need to get your attitude right, he says. Instead of asking me, who do I have to love in order to get what I want? I need you to think about, I need you to change the way you think. Metanoia, change from being this way to thinking like this. Think more kingdom mindset. Think more kingdom hospitality. You need to ask, how can I love every single person I meet, including the stranger, with reckless abandon for their sake, even though I might have to get uncomfortable to do so? Jesus calls for us to ask ourselves, how can I have a posture of welcoming and loving the stranger no matter who it is, no matter what the cost is? Not for my sake, but for their sake. Not for my comfort, but for their comfort. The Good Samaritan reminds us again of Jesus' mission, a mission focused on reaching people, reaching everyone, the insider and the outsider, with the good news of redemption and reconciliation and restoration. It's a challenge for us. If you live a life led with a posture of love, if you live this, this radical kingdom hospitality, Jesus says at the very end of, of his teaching, do this and you will live. You don't get always what you think you're going to get, but you get what I need you to have. And if you live a life focused on reaching people, if you live your life with a posture of love, of radical kingdom hospitality, you'll find that not only will you get what you want, but you'll get what God wants you to have. I don't know how many of you have ever experienced kingdom hospitality, like been the recipient, been the one on the side of the road, and had someone from somewhere else in life come and, and pour grace over you. It's a really weird situation nowadays, like you probably don't see. I've talked about going to El Salvador a number of times, in, in usually our Sunday mornings, and, and in closing, I want to share with you my experience with Kingdom Hospitality. I visited the, the small Central American country back in 2014, and I think my experience there gives me the clearest picture of what Kingdom Hospitality is and what Kingdom Hospitality does. In August 2014, I traveled to El Salvador with our church as an exploratory trip with a group, a small group of nine people to see if there was any opportunity to grow a partnership with another church there in the country. A few things to note about my trip there. One, I don't speak Spanish, so everything I saw made no sense to me. Like, I, after 10 days of being in another country and flying into the Atlanta airport and being able to read the menus at the restaurants, I was like, this is awesome. I didn't, I didn't speak Spanish. So, and literally everything's in Spanish, which makes sense. Um, I, don't like, I don't like traveling a whole lot. I don't like going to other places, especially places I'm not really comfortable in and have no idea what it's like. Um, I didn't, to be honest, I didn't even really want to go. Uh, I was just on the team because I foolishly thought hey, you know what would be a really good mission trip for high school kids? Taking them to a, a small country in Central America that I have no clue about. So why not? Like, this would be a great idea. That's why, that was my reason for going on the trip. Because I was like, I'm just going to take kids, and it's going to be this great thing. I've taken kids to New York City. I've taken kids to, to Colorado. I've taken kids to Minneapolis. I've taken them to New Orleans. I've taken them to Montana. I've taken them to, you name it. I've taken them there. I'm like... I'm going to take them, the next big thing in my ministry, I'm going to take them out of the country. That was my, my reason. That was my reason for going on that trip. I didn't know anything about the, the country. I had no clue. Like, I was like, oh, everyone speaks English, right? No. Like, that's not true. I had no clue, other than what Main Street Media said about what the country. If you know anything about the country, there's a huge civil war back about 25, 30 years ago. And gang violence 
is probably the worst in any country. Like, you'd go into villages and they'd be split right in two with two different gangs. And if you cross the street, you're, you're unsafe. And, and also you hear, like, kids trying to get to our country, right? That's what you know about El Salvador. Just based on mainstream media, you know that, that there are, are young people trying to migrate up into our country. That's, what, that's the only thing I knew about El Salvador. So I was nervous. I was nervous b- before leaving because I don't, all these things, I, I, I did not know what I was getting myself into. And we flew in on a Saturday, which meant on Sunday we'd be going to church. And we went to a, a, a partner church of another, uh, one of the Milwaukee churches. It was called Los Airways. And we, we came in through San Salvador and we drove through smaller villages and we, we arrived at this tiny building that's brightly colored with a cross on the top of it. When we arrived, we, we were told, like, down the hill there, you can't go. Like, just stay with us. So we went into the church, and obviously, like, everything is a whirlwind to me. I didn't know what was being said. I kind of, like, knew some of the songs, but I didn't understand their customs. I didn't understand their culture. Like, people were, people were dancing and singing and, and, and saying things, and I was, I was just oblivious to it all. And as I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm not understanding things, but all of a sudden they're like, bringing out food. I'm like, I understand food. I get food. I'm like, finally, something I can, I can get, all, get on. And after worship, this community of people who welcomed us into the church, never met us before, welcomed us into their church, threw out like huge tables, and like this most incredible chicken and rice dinner that you will ever have. And they roll it out for us. I'm just like, after a day of trying to get my bearings, I'm like, finally, food. I know how to eat. Um, and the meal we had, it was incredible. We, and after we took a, a, a trip through their, their village, we got to meet some of the people in their, in their homes. We got back in our van to head back to the, the hotel that we were staying at. And our, our trip guide from Milwaukee told us this. The meal that we had that day was a meal that they only prepare one time a year during Christmas. I remember sitting there for the first time and being like, what? Like, that doesn't make sense. That's that's like a Monday night dinner for us. That's like a regular thing for us. Why why after just, just knowing us for an hour, why would, why would they throw out the greatest food spread that they could come up with for people that they wouldn't know? Later on that week, we're touring another community, and we pulled up to this community in our, in our van, and all of a sudden you hear drums. And you're like, what is happening? Like, the kids must be out. And the drums got louder and louder, and it's, so it's, and it's not just one drum, it's like a drum line of drums. And as we're pulling up to this village, you just see like this crowd of people, just kids and, and adults. And I don't know if you've ever seen like the end of Indiana Jones and the, the Temple of Doom, where like all the kids are around and every, like they return the stone and it's great. Like we get out of the van and there it's just like swarms of kids all around us, hugging us and wanting to say hello. I mean, it's like as far as the eye can see. And I'm like, what is happening here? And they, they have a parade through the village for us. What is happening? We just pulled up in this red van. They didn't know who we were. We went to their school, and the kids were so excited to show us everything. They put on musical acts. They had dance troops. They presented us with gifts. And then we had another meal with Coke and Fanta. They can't afford this stuff. I've never experienced anything like this. I didn't know what was being said. I had no clue what what they were doing. I just was going off of what the news was telling me about El Salvador. I was just going off of of what, what, what I heard about their country. I had no clue. I had no clue hospitality could be like this. 
I went to El Salvador thinking that I was going to get something to lead me into a deeper experience with God. I thought I was going to grow deeper in my relationship. But I left El Salvador with an experience and an understanding of hospitality that I cannot even begin to really, truly describe. You see, I got exactly what I wanted in a far more meaningful way and exactly the way that God knew that I needed to get it. Just in the way that God makes things like that happen. I want to share with you a picture. I don't know if you're going to be able to see it. Um, Katie, you have that picture of my notebook? Perfect. I know you can't read it. Um, but this, bo- this was one of our, ni- one of our nights. Um, I should explain this. We debrief every single evening. And we talk about our day. And this was, this was Indiana Jones Day, okay? And I know you can't read it really well, but just the bottom of this page here, it says, Salvadorans understand, thank you, what true hospitality looks like. Like, I never thought about hospitality in my life before. Ever. And I experienced kingdom hospitality like I've never experienced it before. And on the right side of the page there, again, I know you can't see it, but let me just tell you, I wrote a question. I said, what would church look like if a guest walked through the door and experienced unrelenting grace and hospitality like I did today? Friends, if we just go off what the news says, what we hear about the immigrants and the nasty gang culture in El Salvador, we would see them like the Jews saw the Samaritans, and we can't be dishonest about that. We would see people like that and be like, no, nah. it's the same. It's the same. We feel like they're so depraved, they're so lost, they're the ones in need, they're the ones who need us to save them. Now maybe I wasn't beaten on the road, but maybe I wasn't robbed and left for dead. But I'll tell you, in so many ways, my mindset was broken as I went into that experience. I was so worried about Who do I have to love, Lord, so that I get what I want? My eyes and my mind were set on the things that I wanted, and then God showed up through people who shouldn't be the ones giving anything because they didn't have anything for my sake. And in my life and in my experience, God showed up in the form of kingdom hospitality, and he flipped my question on its end. I asked, Lord, Who do I have to go to in love so I get this thing right? What country, which village do I have to go to to proclaim your love so that I fulfill my calling of preaching the gospel? Tell me, Lord, and I will go. But if it's okay, I'd like to go to the place that I feel comfortable. I'd like to go to a place where I can choose my neighbors. Sure, I'll ask you who my neighbors are, and I'll go places nervously, but but I'll only do it if I can fulfill my quota of getting what I want so I can earn your favor. But just as Jesus does to the lawyer, God flipped my question. It's not about who your neighbor is. It's not about how you should get what you want at the end of the day. The question you need to ask is how should you love your neighbor the things that I should turn myself toward is, is how can I have more of a kingdom mindset? Lord, how can, can I love people more? Will you just show me through your people that, that I think can't do it as well as I can? Will you show me philozenia? Will you show me hospitality? Will you shower me with grace and love in ways that I can't even begin to understand? Because when I put construct of grace and love and who I love and who my neighbor is, I miss it. I feel like Jesus says, let me show you how much I love you through people you would never think had the potential to love you like that. I'll tell you, when I was studying this text this week, I didn't really think about my experience in El Salvador at all. And the more I read it, I was like, My experience in El Salvador was what was happening here in the the Good Samaritan story. I lived the message of the Good Samaritan. I experienced the point of Jesus' parable. And what I couldn't put into words five years ago when I'm, I'm trying to say, like, what is this hospitality thing? I don't understand. I think what the Good Samaritan leads me to understand is that 
what I experienced five years ago was kingdom hospitality. Five years ago, Jesus showed up in a way that I never thought he could through the presence of amazing people who didn't look like me, who didn't speak my language, who didn't live the life I lived. Jesus showed up in the presence and the extravagant love of these wonderful Salvadoran people to show me hospitality. But it's more than just hospitality. It's more than just a cup of coffee. It's more than just a smile. It's kingdom hospitality. It's, It's laying your comfort out so that others can be comfortable. Hospitality is not just something that we can do on a Sunday morning. Kingdom hospitality is so much more than a cup of coffee or a smile or a handshake. It's becoming uncomfortable. It's extending the welcoming heart of God to all people at all times, lifting them up, empowering them, including them in our, that, including them in, even though our world tells them that they're strangers. Even though our world tells us that we should be fearful. Kingdom hospitality means making space in your life to love and welcome a stranger because it isn't about who your neighbor is. Kingdom hospitality is how you should love your neighbor. When Jesus went to the cross, he didn't care who he'd come to die on the cross for. He came to to fulfill his mission to reconcile people back to God. That's kingdom hospitality. When I showed up with this group of people in a small Salvadoran village, I was given their best They didn't care who I was. Their mission was to shower me with reckless love and unmerited grace. That's kingdom hospitality. Church, what does kingdom hospitality look like for you? Maybe, maybe this day you ask God, Lord, will you open my eyes and open my mind to a different way of looking at the world that's oriented toward giving up what what I want? giving up my comforts for the sake of others. Because I believe what the the story of the Good Samaritan teaches us, it's turning toward the stranger, loving the stranger, becoming uncomfortable so the stranger might feel and experience comfort. It's in doing that we might know this extravagant, radical kind of love that Jesus has for us. That's where I thought I was going to end this morning. Um... I feel I'm way o- I'm my way over here today. Um, I'd like to listen. Here's a look behind the curtain on my, my drive over. I'd like to listen to like indie style Christian music, which I gave Chris a hard time for about earlier. I'm just like, give me some like di- like 2018 music, Chris, not 1994 Newsboys. Um, on my way over, I like I w- wasn't thinking anything. I was just like. Just get in the mindset. Three songs in a row. We're all focused on opening, being open to the movement of God. Friends, I think we get caught up in the ways of this world. We get tangled up in the ways of this world. We get tangled up in the fear that's prescribed for us. And I think that it's so easy to miss the movement of God. It's so easy to walk on the other side of the street because we don't want to get our hands dirty. We don't want to get our souls dirtied by other people's messes. Good Samaritan story just, it leans me in to, to understand more that, that whatever God says, we should probably listen to, right? Whatever God moves, wherever God moves, we should probably want to move with. Whatever change God calls us to make in our lives, maybe we should consider it. Maybe we can go to the other side of the street and check the situation out. We get so caught up in the ways of this world. We get so caught up in the the things that are prescribed for us in this world. And and, and all Luke has, has led me to believe is that you need to change the way you think. Change the way you act. Love people the way I love people. Extend hospitality. Pursue others' hearts the best you can. I don't know where that came from, but I feel like I just need to get that out. Let's pray. Lord, your heart pursues us in quite tangible ways sometimes. In other ways, it's not, we can't even begin to understand. But your heart doesn't stop being on mission for people like us. Your heart doesn't stop being on people Uh, being on mission for people who are not like us. 
who are tangled up in the ways of this world and, and messed up by what we're told. And God, I just continue to, to, to work in a spirit of metanoia that, that we begin to change our thoughts, change our ways, change our practices to, to imitate more of who you are. So this day I pray, do whatever you want to do, say whatever you want to say, move however you want to move, change whatever you need to change in us, Lord, so that we might become more and more like the Good Samaritan, unfazed and willing to be servants like you reaching out, not to just those here in this church, in this, these walls, but to whomever crosses our paths. Create in us hearts to be willing participants in your mission to reach all people. Because that's your heart. Your mission was to reach people. Mold us into becoming willing servants who reach out to be your hands and feet for anyone we come in contact with. Lord, we love you. We give you thanks this day. We ask all of this in your son's name. Amen.